I don't think that a coach can necessarily poach a client from you. I think this is a problem with framing the situation. If you could do one thing to improve British powerlifting, what would it be? I think that's subtly more rewarding for me than the athlete realizes. Hello and welcome to my first of many Q&A specials. So I recently gave you guys the opportunity to ask me questions that I will answer on this YouTube video. Um, and now I have a good list of interesting questions that I will answer in this video. So without any further ado, let's begin. All right, so the first one is biggest mistakes new coaches fall into. Um, I think in my experience, the, f the biggest mistakes, so I'll, I'll list a couple. I think first and foremost is so many people go into coaching, powerlifting, um, particularly online coaching as a side hustle. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think there needs to be a mindset of approaching it um, like a business rather than just a side job. Um, and I think treating it with a level of professionalism, I think is something that coaches um, need to do um, first and foremost. And I think I think the second one is actually understanding the idea of value, right? If you're, if you're a coach, people are paying you for a service, right? So, and understanding that the, the concept of value, where there's an exchange of value, where someone pays you money and you offer them a certain level of value, understand that the value that you offer is going to lim be limited, right? And so understand that because it is limited, professional development is going to be very key, especially at the start of your career, like especially if you want to break into it, right? Because you're going to be competing against a lot of people who are going to be a lot more experienced than you are and not more knowledgeable. So understand that, you know, this is something that you really want to be investing within yourself and so if you invest um, value into yourself you're going to be able to offer more value for each client and more value to more people right so you know I you know I understand that you know it can be very rewarding when you first start getting paid for coaching uh, but before you start spending it you know on your lifestyle really focus on you know, if I were to turn back the hands of time, I would actually just reinvest all of the revenue back into myself because that's going to give me um, longevity um, and it's going to improve myself as a coach long-term. So that's probably, um, I would say, the biggest mistake um, that I made. And I think a lot of coaches getting into it, that's probably where... Um, most people are making their mistakes from my experience. Next question. Uh, have you ever had a client poached from you? So I don't think that, I don't think that a coach can necessarily poach a client from you. I think that, I think this is a problem with, framing the situation okay so what I mean by that is if you've developed a good relationship with your client if you are someone who is able to solve their problems and meet their needs I don't think another coach can take that away from you um you know if 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 a co if a coach is quote-unquote able to poach a client from you um I think that you were not able to satisfy your client's needs. And I think the I think the problem with framing a coach poaching a client from you is really you as a coach abdicating your part in losing the client, if that makes sense. So 
you know, acknowledging where I think it's a problem of not acknowledging where you may have been inadequate in servicing their client. And I think if you frame the situation like that and you take on responsibility of the situation, you will start to realize where there are gaps on your side of the service. And that's, that is going to be a much more productive way of framing the situation. Um, and that will, you know, motivate you to become better and develop yourself and actually revise what you need to improve on. So I hope that answers the questions. Um, if you could do one thing to improve British powerlifting, what would it be? This is a difficult one. Um, I think yeah, whenever you, the way I see things is, whenever you see problems, um, they're generally systemic. You know, uh, and you know, wherever, whenever you look at um, the occurrence of problems. You, you should always, you know, you you can always look at how things are structured um, and, and the, the structure or systems that are in place often dictate problems that arises. I think... Yeah, this is a bit of a difficult one because, like... Yeah, there are you know there are small problems here and there, but I think I think the biggest problem, and this is probably a little bit more biased towards the region that I'm from, um, is actually supporting um, supporting the demand of competitions and having a level of um, uh, uniformity across how regions are managed. I think would be probably where I would look towards. So, you know, improving, um, improving the number, increasing the number of competitions that um, are available, as well as, um, you know, making, um, you know, making the experience of lifters across the country a little bit more uniform. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's probably what I would say. Um, the next question is, who is my favorite mentee? Um, I don't have a, you know, I know this is a bit of a cop-out question. I don't have a favorite mentee. I think I'm equally grateful for, uh, people who've decided to become, um, mentees under my tutelage. I think, you know, um, it's also given, you know, you guys, have given me the opportunity to almost also like revise what I think I already know. Um, and that's always good for my own learning as well. So yeah, I don't have a favorite mentee. Um, oh, the next question is going to be an interesting one. Um, are there any underrated coaching concepts in your opinion? Um, I think one that comes to mind is The idea of assessing the athlete, and I think this is, um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of explain to you what I mean by that. Um, the context of what I'm saying, uh, the context of saying this is, the goal that I'm thinking about, the the the, the idea I'm thinking about is uh, athlete autonomy. How you foster athlete autonomy, right? How you know, because you're not going to be there to babysit them all the time. And, you know, when you're not there, you want them to be able to make good decisions with their training if there are obstacles in a way. And being able to make good decisions come from understanding what the goal is and understanding how to maneuver uh, obstacles. You know, let's say things are not showing up uh, or something's not available. You know, what do you do? You know, what do you do? when things are not going well, right? And one concept that I think is underrated is assessing assessing the athlete's learning, assessing the athlete's understanding, right? And, you know, I think I've seen a lot of new coaches, they, they want to sort of show off what they know and, and, and almost like show off what they understand and 
become quite lectury. Um, and quite often when you lecture someone and when you, when you coach someone and it's quite dictatorial, um, most, most people will just go, will just nod along, say yes, and, um, just carry on. Whereas if you assess for the athletes, assess for learning, assess for understanding, you can often find whether the athlete is on the same page as you and sometimes and this is this is a concept that I learned when I did teacher training before I decided to go into this industry um you know how do you know that you know how do you know if the athlete has um understood and conceptualized things correctly because if you don't conceptualize things correctly, then you're likely to make poor decisions, right? Because the actions that you take are dependent on the judgment of the situation. And the judgment of the situation depends on your perception and your conceptualization. So really understanding, you know, have they understood what they need to be focusing on when they do a squat, when they bench deadlift, you know, do they understand what the purpose of each training session is or each prescription? Do they understand why they're using RPE, right? And what the goal is, you know, in this particular phase of training. Um, and so as I've started doing that over my coaching career, I've noticed that I've, as a coach, I've made a lot of assumptions about their understanding of things and their conceptualization. And when you sort those ideas out, you'll find that the athlete makes better decisions when it comes to training. So I think assessing, assessing for learning and assessing for understanding um, is an underrated coaching concept. And I think that's going to be key for uh, athlete autonomy. Next question is, how can someone who isn't built to deadlift typically overcome this? Um, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a difficult question to answer. Like if you've got functioning arms and legs and you're not injured and you don't have any physical defects, like you're built to deadlift. I guess what you're, I'm trying to put my mind in, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and understand why you're asking that question. I'm going to assume that what you mean by that is what do you do if you don't necessarily have relatively good leverages for deadlifts? Um, let's say, you know, you've got really short arms or, you know, you, you have really long legs and you have a really high hip position or whatever. Um, I don't think this necessarily changes uh, anything because at the end of the day, you still want to, you still want to have good technique. You still want to have good programming. Um, this doesn't really change. Um it almost feels like you're trying to change something that isn't within your realm of control. Like you can't change your leverages, right? You know, someone who isn't necessarily typically built for deadlift may be built for bench pressing, for example. And that's a trade-off, right? But, you know, a good example of this is someone like uh, Eddie Berglund from Sweden, right? Like he gets a really good subtotal, but when it comes to his deadlift, relative to other people in this class, he's nowhere near the top. Right. So, and that's not within your control. Unfortunately, that's genetics. So you really can't overcome that side. I think reframing the idea of being able to trying to change something that you can't change. Um, and understand that that's actually what's going on in your mind. Um, it's probably how you're going to overcome not being built for deadlift. But yeah, just focus on doing the good things, good, doing the correct things, you know, like clean up your technique, Make sure you're able to hinge well. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're not, if you don't move well when you're deadlift, then you're not going to be able to deadlift well. So really focus on that. 
and just have proper programming as well like you know it could could it be that your programming is leading uh you to not make as good of a progress in your deadlift as you could excuse me so yeah that's what that's probably what i would say to that um who had your favorite performance at uh uh juniors european juniors um I I know this is a bit of a cop out answer. Um, there's not any particular lifter, but there's probably a particular class, and I think um, this is this has been quite sort of uh, consistent, like through the years. I think my my favorite class to watch is always like the ninety threes. I think eighty threes or ninety threes. I think ninety threes, ninety threes because. Um, it's so competitive and close at the top. Like it's not obvious who's likely to necessarily win. And that's what keeps it exciting. And I think, um, yeah, let's say the top, top three lifters, um, in the 93 juniors is probably, um, those were the, my favorite performance at the top because it like could have really gone either way. And I think that's what really makes like, um, powerlifting competitions um fun to watch um seeing if they're able to make it when you know like when the situation really depends whether they make that final deadlift or not i think yeah so it's not my favorite lifter uh but it's probably my favorite class to watch um got any so next question is got any plans to compete um so yes, I, I do actually have plans to compete. Um, you know, I think when there is a right uh, time to... I'm going to be finding... Um, what's the word? Uh, a right competition at a right time uh, where I don't have a lot of lifters that I'm prepping for competitions for. Um, last time I competed was back in 2017. Um, if you guys didn't already know. Um, and I think after, after that, I took a, um, I took a break from powerlifting training for myself. You know, I, 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 I did a, uh, a few years of Olympic weightlifting and then I did a few years of endurance running. And I think more, more recently I'm actually getting back into, uh, powerlifting training myself. Um, I think my time frame is actually within the next year. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. Um favorite part about coaching. I I think so two things come to mind. I think I think the first I think to understand my favorite part of coaching, you really sort of understand why I coach in the first place. Um one of the one of the most one of the sort of meaningful aspects of why I became a coach in the first place was really to help develop better individuals. Um, I think, you know, like why, why do sports? Why, why do powerlifting? I think training in powerlifting and going through the process has always been a way for preparing to deal with life. Um, you know, if you're, if you get better at a sport, if you go through the process of, you know, becoming a better powerlifter, you become a better individual, you learn to deal with obstacles, um, you learn to positively reinforce yourself when obstacles come. And so, and that, you know, this is something that, you know, um, I identify with when Dave... Tate said that when I first started getting into coaching you know he he said that training was always to do with learning to deal with life and so with that context in mind I think one of my favorite part of coaching favorite parts of coaching is seeing a attitude change in the athlete you know when an athlete becomes a lot more mature um, they're a lot more 
like stoic with a big S um, with regards to dealing with situations. Um, I think that's subtly more rewarding for me than the athlete realizes. So seeing you demonstrate a better attitude towards yourself and towards training and towards others is one of my favorite parts of coaching. Um, with regards to more like specific sides of coaching, I think also, um, I think, I think an easy answer would obviously be, you know, seeing the athlete, um, uh, you know, succeed, you know, that's obviously, um, uh, one of the, one of my, um, favorite parts of coaching. But I think with a slightly more nuanced side of coaching, I think, I think as my, yeah, so I will say this. So as I develop as a coach and as I develop my systems and processes, I find that when it comes to taking on a new athlete, um, I get a much more longer streak of successful training uh, because I get everything right from the get-go. Um, and so that is, and, and seeing that play out um is is seeing that play out is also probably one of my favorite parts of coaching as well next question this one's going to be a juicy one uh what runs through your mind when an athlete leaves you for another coach what's the process so this has really uh this has really changed within me um compared to like how I approach this situation is completely different to how I would approach that situation before. I think um, so I would also say it really depends on the individual. Sometimes you do find yourself working with an athlete where whereby the you know the expectations are not you know are not quite um, aligned um the you know um you know the conditions do not quite meet um and you're not both not quite on the same page and you know i think sometimes it almost feels like a relief but not quite um because you really want to iron that out as early on as possible um you know so that no one has a negative experience working with each other um but sometimes it's not obvious whether a certain aspect can change or not. Um, if if a certain aspect of the uh, uh, difference, um, but sometimes you know if you're not able to solve a problem, I think I. Nowadays, I always see it as, you know, as cliche as this is, is honestly an opportunity for learning. Um, it's an opportunity to develop um, your own sort of uh, system of analysis when it comes to tro uh, troubleshooting problems. Um, I think because I regularly have um, mentors in my um, development, um, I always use this as an opportunity to discuss what I could have done better. Um, sometimes, most often, nowadays, if I do lose a client, most often than not, I can almost see it coming. Um, sometimes it's a situation where um, I've done everything that I could and if I'm not able to solve their problems, um, you know, then, you know, that's fair enough. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, um, more recently it's price related and, you know, I think that's obviously not something that, um, necessarily within my control, if that makes sense. Like I'm not willing to just race to the bottom when it comes to my prices. Um, you know, if, a if, a, an athlete does go for another coach because they're cheaper, because obviously you know, like within the context of where we are in time, um, you know, there's obviously like hard 
economic conditions. Um, but yeah, like I would say, um, you know, sometimes I do see it coming. If I don't see it coming, um, I often ask for feedback as well. Um, you know, to see if there's anything that, um, you know, is, if there's anything that I've missed out, if there was a blind spot. Um, otherwise, I would just speak to my mentors about it. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Um, how to improve bench press? So this is a very general question. This is a very generic question. Um, if you're asking this, I'm going to make two assumptions. Either either you've plateaued with your progress, um, like you're not improving at all, or you're either um, dissatisfied with your rate of progress. Um, I, you know, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because it's kind of like, you know, a, a generic question is going to get, you know, get you a generic answer. So I would probably just say, you know, um, are you, you know, are, have you, are you doing the right things? Have you got, you know, have you improved on your technique? Are you actually doing too much in your training in your programming? Right. So when quite often, uh, when people are dissatisfied with their progress, people often default towards training harder, which ne isn't necessarily always the answer. And I think understanding uh, the idea that more is not always better and that there is an idea of a sweet spot when it comes to training dose. Um, there is an idea of like an optimal level of intensity um, allows you to be able to think about your programming slightly differently. And that may be the um, answer to your question. Um, so next one is, where's all of Norm's lifting footage hiding? Um, if you scroll back on my, if you scroll back far enough in my Instagram, you'll probably see it. Um, so yeah, it's there. Uh, what's your favorite video to make so far? Um, actually, two two comes to mind. Um, one of them um, is the you know is low RP work pointless? I think that was probably one of my favorite ones to make, and actually kind of showed um, my my passion for that topic almost like showed in 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 how well that video did. Uh, you know, it was one of my early videos and it actually almost like went viral. Um, I think I'm approaching like 10,000 views on that one. Um, at the time of this, time of this video, um, you know, I, I still only had a, a few hundred subscribers. Um, and the reason why it was my favorite video to make was because I think I just explained that video very well. And it's often a problem that I think a lot of athletes have where um, they feel like low RPE work is somewhat pointless, that there's no, you know, you're, you're sort of almost holding yourself back um, by doing low RPE work. Um, so that was probably one of my favorite. The, set, the other favorite video is the one I'm actually going to record later today, uh, which is about uh, weight classes, how to find your weight classes, because I actually did... I actually spent uh, a bit of time doing some first-hand research on how tall lifters were at the top. And so um, there's a, you, you'll, you'll see why. There's a couple funny things that um, happened when researching for that video. Um, in your opinion, what is the most important service provided by a powerlifting coach? I would say probably two things right well one thing but it sort of leads to the other i think the idea to help solve the problem um and i think the 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 passion for solving problems um and the uh, you know and paying attention is essentially what a, you know what a powerlifting coach should be doing right because otherwise you can just sort of get a cookie cutter program or you can get a programming service. I think when, when an athlete has decided to um, 
hire a powerlifting coach, they really want someone to pay attention. Um, you know, from my personal experience and from what I see in others. If you are someone um, who is passionate about solving their problems and you're someone who pays attention, it can really eclipse um, any level of inadequacy that you may have with regards to whether, you know, with regards to, let's say, your understanding of biomechanics or um, your proficiency in programming or whatnot. Um, because so long as you pay attention and that you show that you are dedicated to solving their problems, it will motivate you to develop yourself and it will motivate you to, um, uh, you know, improve yourself in order to be able to match up your competency to the task at hand, right? And I think athletes will know if you are someone who is like that. Um, because if you didn't show your passion in solving a problem, if you didn't show um, attention, you know, their tolerance for having obstacles is going to be very short-lived. Um, they're going to find um, a reason to stop working with you. So I would say, showing your commitment to solving their problems and paying attention. Next question is, how do you program accessories for the clients? Um, so this is going to, I'll probably make a whole separate video about this, but I'll probably give you like a brief rundown of what I think about. So first things first is actually looking at the context of where the athlete is. You know, what, what, how much capacity does the athlete have with accessories? Because, you know, there are some athletes who have a lot more capacity for training. And so they'll have a, um, a lot more accessories. But with a lot of people who are sort of working with a day job, um, their accessories tend to be very minimalistic. So I generally like to... My personal philosophy is I generally like to um, find accessories that can solve multiple problems at the same time. So, you know, let's say someone has a bit of a sort of mobility movement issue at the same time they want to increase their back strength. You know, I might give a exercise that can solve those problems. Um, you know, I also look at, you know, First things first, I also look at how are how is the athlete technically speaking? You know, if does an athlete have a movement issue? Does an athlete have an issue with managing center of gravity in a squat or deadlift? Um, and that's the first thing that I look at when it comes to figuring out um, an accessory that may assist with that. Um, and then secondly, I look at does the athlete have a work capacity issue? So, you know, is someone technically good, but then their form tends to break down? And is that because of a work capacity within um, uh, a certain movement? Is that a work capacity issue within certain muscle groups? And then selecting accessories around that. And then generally, you know, um, accessories that um, are important for uh, their physical development, for muscle hypertrophy, um, and leveraging what the client enjoys is going to be um path of least resistance um because if the athlete enjoys the actual accessories they're more likely to pay attention to them and actually train them with a bit more intention so that's what i would say the next question is is there an, a level an athlete reaches where training on competition spec equipment is a necessity so I've always held this opinion. Um, I think competition equipment is is a nice to have, not a must have. You know, like I I remember, you know, a couple of years ago, um, some time ago, I, I 
spoke to I remember speaking to Joy Namani once um and you know she trains she she you know at this time she was already like world champion like several years in several competitions and she trains in a pure gym right like no comp spec plates no comp spec bars no competition spec benches and she's able to become world champion like it's not a necessity it's useful right so i'll give an example like for example when you start pulling over let's say 220 to 240 kilos like deadlifting with a power bar versus deadlifting not with a power bar does feel different and i think it's useful but at the end of the day you should tr see training purely as what it is right it's is, is training is preparing yourself as well as you can um, um, for a competition and I don't think you know if, if a world champion um, who's had multiple world titles is able to train without comp spec equipment I, I don't think you necessarily need it um, I think from a safety aspect you know let's say you you know if I, if I really come to think about this question properly you know if you're someone who squats like 300 plus kilos um if you don't have a barbell that can tolerate that level of load then there may be a safety aspect to that like you know if 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 the barbell isn't um what's the word if the barbell isn't tolerated to that level of strength then yeah that you know it might be a necessity to have a certain power bar but it doesn't need to necessarily be um an alico bar right like um so long as the bar doesn't permanently bend after you load a certain weight, then, you know, I think for the vast majority of people, like you don't need a uh, comp spec. So maybe if you're like, you know, elite, uh, world-class, maybe, you know, and if you're, if you're deadlifting over 330 kilos or whatever, and the bar will start to deform if you don't use a more, a higher level bar then you know that's probably a situation where i think it's useful um to use competition spec equipment so i hope that answers your question um what's the f the next question is what's the first thing you look at when onboarding a new client so obviously like i look at everything but i think the very first thing is why has this athlete to, to really set the context of taking them on as a client um yeah so i would say the first thing i look at is probably um why has why has this athlete decided to go with you as opposed to anyone else and what is their perception of what you can offer versus that many other coaches might not be able to offer because yes there are many powerlifting coaches but what we offer in terms of an experience is going to be very different right so i'm someone who's very psychologically in tune with the athlete or i like to think i am um i'm someone who sort of provides that um uh, a much more uh what's the word i i like to take in your own personal values into account with how you approach powerlifting training a lot um, and some coaches may not necessarily offer that. Some coaches only want to work with people who are able to fully commit to powerlifting, right? Um, and there's no right or wrong way of approaching it. It's just what different coaches offer. Um, you know, some you know some some powerlifting coaches may be more of a biomechanics expert. Some powerlifting coaches. Um, may offer you know um, a much more data approach uh, data driven way of uh, um, coaching powerlifting right so first things first is yeah why has the athlete why has the client decided to come to you as opposed to anyone else is the first thing that I look at how to determine the width of your squat stance based on leverage um so a very sort of basic principle is 
if you visualize um, squat width as a spectrum, and on one end, you're optimizing for minimal uh, work done based on how much um, distance you travel. And then the opposite end of that spectrum where you have a really narrow stance, you're optimizing for putting yourself in a best position to produce force vertically down into the floor. Right. So, you know, as a, yeah, if you're, if you're squatting, um, you're, you, you're basically putting force vertically down into the floor. Right. And the best way you can do that is to put your feet directly underneath you. And that's why some people have opted to go for a super narrow stance, um, where you optimize, um, your ability to just put force vertically down. But if you have a slightly, if you have a extremely wide stance, um, you 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 know some of that force um, is there's going to be part of that force that is going to be horizontal in nature, um, which is less efficient. But at the same time, you end up moving um, through less range of motion. I generally say. Um, you know, a narrow stance isn't necessarily the best stance for everyone because you you might not necessarily be able to physically squat to depth. So what I normally say to people is as narrow as possible while still being able to hit depth. And I think for most people, for most people's leverages, that tends to be about shoulder width or ever so slightly than shoulder width apart. Um, you know, if I'm taking on a new athlete um even though you may make a biomechanical um argument to have a slightly different stance if they're quite experienced already i am much more inclined to not change their stance because it might not necessarily be conducive to immediately better performance right you know a good example of this is, and I'm, I know I'm slightly digressing here, but, you know, just to help prove a point. Um, so in, a, in the world of sprinting, like Usain Bolt amongst sprinting coaches is often known to have one of the poorest um, sprinting techniques in the world. Like he's not textbook in a certain way. But if you were to ask most coaches whether you would actually, you know, towards the end of his career, would you actually change his technique? You probably wouldn't because he's learned to be able to perform with that movement strategy, if that makes sense. So yeah, if you're if you're new into the sport or you're still relatively young, um, then you can always play around to see where you feel strong and what you can hit depth and feel tight at the bottom. And then just honestly like fully commit to that i think a, a problem that a lot of people do is they experiment way too much and that causes a lot of um inconsistencies and um you know in their progress next question is how did how do you uh get started in coaching so yeah just a bit of a background to what I was doing before that, I think. So I, I graduated from UCL with a physics degree. Uh, I did theoretical physics at UCL. Um, after that, you know, I just I just sort of fell into teacher training. I thought, okay, I, I don't know what I wanted to do. And I just thought I'd do the thing that made most sense based on what I wanted to do, which was to sort of be in some sort of like teaching role. And I realized that, career of a teacher wasn't for me um i quit um i was unemployed for a few months i worked as a waiter for a couple months and then it just slowly occurred to me in my mind what i wanted to do with my life which was coach powerlifting and you know i was neither someone who was necessarily educated in strength conditioning or um you know, someone who was necessarily um you know, like I wasn't a high level lifter myself, but I knew I wanted to do that. So I'd work 
from the bottom and just build experience coaching people in general. So I qualified as a fitness instructor and personal trainer and I worked um, my way up from there, uh, basically. Um, and, you know, um, and I think very early on, I sort of offered to, you know, powerlifting coaching wasn't really a thing when I first started getting involved with it. Like back in 2012, like there were barely any powerlifting coaches. Um, and so, yeah, I started to offer uh, coaching for free and, and I just built my experience up from coaching people for free. And then one of the people that I coached ended up uh, starting the uh, UCL Barbell Club. Um, he was a UCL student. Um, at the time, it was called UCL Weightlifting Society, um, which is now called UCL Barbell Club. And I became the coach for that club and I built my experience from there. So my career really started in um, university powerlifting. Okay, and the last question is, do you have hard feelings when your lifter quits your coaching or any feelings when you meet ex-lifters? You know, if, if you really want to sort of uh, go into the psychological aspect of, aspect of it, it's always, it used to be a lot more upsetting, right? So, you know, early on, uh, I think one of the things um, that I probably had a hard time dealing with was failure. Um or the idea of failure. My my relationship with failure was quite hard. So I never necessarily resented them, but it was more like I would judge myself quite a lot. And that held me back quite a bit. And I think learning to, you know, I'm friends with people that I used to work with, right? Um, and I've learned to have developed a lot more of a growth mindset from it. Um, and I think having had uh, mental performance coaching and having had mentoring, um, I've really developed a productive and constructive relationship with um, that occurrence if, you know, if a client moves on. Um, and it's always an opportunity to learn. And it's, it's really um, me, what's the word? Owning the idea of um, that you're not perfect, you, you don't know everything and you're not, um, you're not all knowing. Um, and it's a really good driver to motivate you to get better. Um, so yeah, no, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have any hard feelings, quote unquote. I think most of the feelings that I did used to have was mostly self-directed. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, I think nowadays, it, you know, I, I really do see, um, you know, may, maybe they are done right. Like maybe, you know, I, I've had a lift of seven years that um, has parted ways with me. And it's like, there's only so much that a lifter can learn from a coach. Um, and there's always utility in, in, in lifters um uh, uh playing around with um what's the word um other coaches to get slightly different perspectives um and that's a normal thing it's a very common thing in powerlifting and and in sport as well so you know um but there's no hard feelings there's never hard feelings between um a coach and athlete um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, like I said, you know, this is the first of many Q and A's. I hope you guys enjoy this content. Um, if you like this, click like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you guys on the next one.